good noon, morning, afternoon, whatever you want to call it. Thank you all for joining us. We have with us today retired Judge Sandra Sims, fabulous criminal defense attorney, and in that sense, also a civil rights attorney, because you can't really separate those two. We'll get into that. Bill Harrison, and an amazing, amazing Renaissance young woman, Radine, who is going to share with us what youth brings to the table, <laughs> to us forever young, but not so visibly young folks. We're part of this. Okay, so I pre-warned you folks, I'm gonna start you off with a little softball question. It's election time. What's at stake? Well, let me start off. Um, I think that question should be, what isn't at stake? Uh, we're in unprecedented times. Uh, you look about what's going on in the news. We've got this obviously this COVID pandemic that's just creating havoc in our um, elderly and in our lives in general uh, with medical issues, emergency issues. We have demonstrations all across the country. Uh, we've got federal uh, uh, police officers quelling demonstrations. Um, you know, our businesses are in, in ruins. Uh, mm -hmm. Specifically in Hawaii, we don't have um, a uh, industry other than tourism, which is just beginning again. So what's at stake? Everything's at stake. We need uh, leaders that can address all of these issues and uh, we haven't had at this point. And so we're mm -hmm. hopeful that this election will produce uh, real leaders that are gonna take over, uh, grab these issues uh, by the horns and, and address them in a proper manner so that we can, as a society, continue to, to, to prosper uh, and we're not prospering now, um, both um, emotionally, culturally, you know, financially and otherwise. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a really brilliant insight, Bill, because if you're really thinking about it as a voter and you're really giving it thought, you would literally have to have a laundry list of every major sector, <clears throat> health and healthcare, housing, <clears throat> education, employment, income, the economy, business, every aspect, every sector of our society. And just ask yourself, of the choices, who gives you more peace to have in charge? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, exactly I was thinking, right. yeah, I was thinking about another aspect of that question as well, a good point that you raised about who's in charge. I think we, Granted, it's, it's hard to not pay attention to what's happening on the national level and, and the lack of leadership thereof. But what is also important, I think, for us as we're going forward is those issues that Bill referenced, you know, things with, you know, with the businesses, with our education, with our health care, with all, a lot of those issues are at the local and state government levels. And it's at the community levels. And those races and those folks who are involved at that level, not just here in Hawaii, but around the country, that's where, you know, that's where the biggest impacts are going to be for just regular folks, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, whether the schools are going to be opening or not opening, you know, that's going to be a, you know, a kind of a local decision. Look at us right here. That's happening here. You know, what's happening with our businesses, how are we supporting them and, and, and then, you know, the same thing with, with, with healthcare, because we're around the country. I mean, all throughout these different ways in, of addressing health issues, the disparities in our healthcare system are just so broad and range from, you know, from folks having to cover everything to those having things at, at, at their access. So it's really hard to kind of, there's not a national system about that. It's very, very local. I had a recent experience, I came back from Michigan and just the other day. And so I came back at the time that you had to have the COVID test before you can board, right? So I'm there trying to figure out, cause how does this work? You know, we hear things about what are the costs and who pays and all this. So I'm at my daughter, she's more uh, savvy on these issues than most. And I was able to go set up an appointment to go to a Walgreens in Ypsilanti, Michigan. I pulled in there. They tell you, you know, they gave you an appointment and a time to come and you just pulled in. They swabbed me and sent me on my way 
I got back to her house. I had the results by the time I got back to the house. It cost me nothing. And I'm sitting here going like, wait a minute. What is all this about the $250 you're paying over here and this you're paying over there? And they're like, just whipped right through. It took all of three minutes. And by the time I got back to her house, we had the results. So you're, you're looking at all these kind of disparities and how these, not just the COVID testing, but other issues as well. So all of that's just all over the place. Somehow they've managed to figure out how to do that to fit Hawaii's requirements, because that's what the test I took was for, was to fit Hawaii's requirements. A Walgreens in Ypsilanti, Michigan knew what to do. I, what is that? <laughs> no, but I think that's a really important point, Sandra, because it's leadership at all levels. Mm -hmm. And you're right. For, for the people, the leadership at the local levels has to be the first recourse, the one that works for them. But in order for that to work, the big fight in D.C. for the last two months has been, we got to have the resources to be able to administer to our people. Yeah. And the, the huge fight has been, Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham want to jam through a pretty far right Supreme Court justice and will not even consider any kind of coronavirus relief at all, economic help, anything. And especially they won't consider any assistance or relief for state and local needs. Yeah. What does that tell you? Yeah. Who the heck do you think they are dishonoring and disrespecting when they do that? People. Radine? Um, I, I really like what everybody said, and I agree. And I think the big answer for me is the fabric of our democracy is at stake. And uh, I think about one of the, the threads to that is um, what I'm most concerned about is a lot of the division that's happening in this country um, among our citizens, among our, our government, um, among our leaders. Um, I, I think even whatever the outcome of the elections are, I, I am um, really waiting with anticipation to see um, how this divisiveness is going to be healed. Um, because I think if it continues to go down the road that uh, we've been going down, then we're in deep trouble as a nation. Um, and, you know, they say a house is divided from within. And, uh, you know, it's, for me, the thought is very scary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to see a lot of uh, the law and order sort of policies and practices that have been taking place uh, is very concerning, um, very concerning. I mean, it's where I feel like we're more in an era of, era of dictatorship uh, than we are of democracy. And I personally don't want to go down that road to um, being part of a dictatorship. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, I think your points are really good. The sense I get is there's two kinds of energies. There's a, there's a very negative energy. People are exhausted yeah. for exactly the reasons that you've just described. Mm -hmm. They are just so tired of all the anger, all of the maliciousness, the vindictiveness, the personal attacks. Mm -hmm. But at least now they're offered a choice. True. Yeah. That is not true of both sides. This is not a war of nasty, vitriolic opponents. Right. You, That's very true. I, I, do, I do think a lot has been anchored and um, I think the hostility is going to have to be healed one way or another. And uh, even if we have a representative uh, who um, has the content of character that we need to bring peace, I think there's a fairly long road ahead. And I don't see that maliciousness necessarily going away immediately. Uh, I was watching something with Brian Schatz last week. And Brian is one of the smartest young politicians I have ever come across. He was actually my daughter's classmate at Punahou. I didn't know him then, have gotten to know him some since. And he's extremely insightful and he's very candid. 
But one of the things he said, which really struck home with me is everybody who knows Joe Biden, who has known him for decades, agrees, you can't hate this guy. Mm. Yeah. He's not that kind of a person. Mm. And so the things that they were able to use against Hillary Clinton, who did engender a, a lot of resentment, a lot of hostility, there were maybe as many votes against her as there were for Trump back in 2016. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. That was the margin, but we don't have that now. I think my, my big tired. concern is on the ground. Yeah. Um, the organized factions that are are happening in, in groups among our citizens and you know i think that's going to be there and we're going to have to learn we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that you know um yeah and i'm not trying to be a pessimist i'm actually optimistic no it's a good question i mean how but uh i just feel like a lot of um the division has been anchored in a way that i've never seen before yes and that has filtered into policy and practice and a part of our culture as, as a nation. And so having, having that healed is, is gonna take some effort. And uh, definitely the leadership uh, is, is, the right leadership is needed to make that happen, but I don't see it immediately going away. Yeah, yeah that's so let me ask yeah. you folks, yeah. how big a factor will it be of whether the other dishonest, rule-breaking, manipulative, get what I want, no matter what it takes, person, <laughs> Mitch McConnell, is no longer in leadership of the Senate. Mm. What kind of difference might that make? Well, obviously, we're, we're talking about an individual who, who wields a lot of power, okay, <laughs> being in the position he's in, um, and um, has a that in that leadership role has a following that that really uh, will call to uh, whatever position that person puts forth. So you want to eliminate if you can take that person out of that position and get someone there who is obviously um, in uh, in terms of his his perspective more just, um, you know, more open, um, you know, more considerate of, of the community at large. Then you change the the outlook and you change the culture in the Senate by doing that. So it's, a, it's really important. And, and uh, just to follow up on what Ray Dean said earlier, you know, I'm concerned about that as well. Um, whoever wins and loses here, you have a group of folks out there um, who are um, really upset and angry, um, no matter which way it goes. And, and you worry about what's going to happen uh, in the in the streets when when the decisions exactly. made as to who the who our new leader is. Um, and so I am also concerned, and I'm generally a, an optimist, and I have to be a little bit pessimistic in when it comes to that issue too. So I'm, I'm concerned as to the fallout of this election as well. I'm obviously concerned as to who we elect, but I'm also concerned as to the fallout. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, that's the concern of mine as well. We've seen some very, very, very disturbing things uh, on the streets, not here, even here in Hawaii, we've seen it. Mm -hmm. And that is is just totally unprecedented here. Uh, the 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 rancor and the ways in which we address and treat each other. I've 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 not ever seen that. And I worked I worked in the, you know the criminal justice system, and we didn't see that kind of thing. Um, so I guess the question then is and, I, and how to do that and how we how we how we address that. I I, I think. I'm not sure exactly how we do that because like Bill says, what, whoever, whatever the outcome is, we still have to address those questions and we still have to prepare for a future for our, for our children and the families in which, you know, there is this, this recognition and an understanding of us having empathy and support for one another. We're losing that. In some places it's completely lost. I, I also I also would like to just say that I think now is the time more than ever that uh, we really can't have a collective of ones. We can, just can't have that leader here and that leader there. It has to be, it really does have to be more than a collective of ones. Yeah. And I think one of the things Brian Schatz also talked about when I was listening to him last week is he said, you know, nobody's paying attention to this. 
but Joe Biden has assembled the most brilliant leadership team he has seen mm -hmm. in all of his years in Washington. Oh, yeah. I, I, He's I, got I, a climate change program that's the most progressive mm -hmm. that's been seen. So one of the questions then is, if you remove from that extremely angry, hostile energy that's part of the division, both the inflammation and triggering of it and the rewards for it that the current leadership has been able to wield. Does that change the playing field? I hope so. Because now, even though they're a minority of 40% give or take, they know that because Trump wields the power he does and McConnell wields the power he does, that they can do things and get away with things that are extremely destructive and punitive to the people that they like to consider their enemies, their opposition. Hey, and I think you're exactly right. It is exactly that artificial division, that us against them style of leadership, mm -hmm. philosophy of leadership, attitudes and behaviors. That's the choice. That's what's at stake at all levels. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. If it's not only not encouraged anymore, but it's not rewarded anymore, mm -hmm. then maybe over time, not instantly, not within a day or a week or a month or maybe even a year, but over time, maybe it burns itself out because it doesn't have anything more to feed on. Uh -huh. I, I think you're right, Chuck. Uh, I would I would like to throw it. I don't. Today's my devil's advocate day. I think. But I would just like to throw in the thought that um, I, I agree with you. Uh, at the same time, it, uh, systems of power have a way of becoming corrupt, even with the best intentions. And so there needs to be some um, parameters set within you know, whatever's to come if there's new leadership. Um, I, I just think that the integrity of leadership is lost and uh, that that really needs to be the foundation on which we start to rebuild. No, and I, I think that's a brilliant insight, Radine, because it redirects our attention to the behind the scenes leadership, whether you call it dark money or the 1% or whatever you call it, but there is a wealth sector, a very small one here, that has been driving this society toward a culture of inequality for decades. Sure. They're not about to let go of that just because they lose one election. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, um, recently I read an article and it was a, it was a very enlightening article um, in uh, the Christian Post where there were a number of um, pro-life evangelists who are uh, a lot of them were very much Trump supporters, and they have changed direction. They have indicated that they will be uh, voting for Biden because, uh, and obviously, as a pro-life evangelist, you're um, in support, uh, I'm opposing uh, abortion as um, you know one of the the, the key um, features in, in in your position. And they were saying that the unfortunate thing is is that uh, more people die from prejudice from from um, you know, lack of food, um, from global warming, um, from so many other uh, areas that um, this president really has no concern for, mm -hmm. that it, it almost becomes a lesser of two evils for them uh, to mm -hmm. a choice to make, and and that's a that's a really dangerous position to be in is to make choices uh, based on you know your lesser of evils, uh, and so it was very enlightening to me that you have people who very much um, were ardent uh, Trump supporters who now have said, you know, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this, even though um, electing a president may in fact be against some of my values. I think overall, I have to take a position that um, that values is outweighed by the destruction uh, of this individual. So, you know, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about looking into making a change that clearly is going to be um, something that um, is going to obviously um, 
go beyond the person uh, into uh, what we need to look at and, and making overall change in our society and, and turning back this tide of destruction uh, by this, this big money, this dark money, as you say, um, people who really have no desire to change um, because they are in the majority, they are the, the power brokers, they are the money holders. Um, and so that, that article really, to me, solidified that belief that, um, you know, we really have to consider what's, what's at stake here. Mm -hmm. So what do you folks make of the phenomenon that an increasing majority of the highest ranking, most respected military and intelligence community leaders have virtually all come out publicly, not only against Trump, but supporting Biden. What does that tell us? I think that goes back to one of the points that Ray Dean had mentioned about this sort of, this need to look at issues regarding integrity and leadership, something that we've not um, seen a lot of, unfortunately. And that, I think those are responses, which are quite honestly, shockingly, um, you know, for in terms of standards that we've seen over the years for persons of those caliber to come out in the way that they have is absolutely shocking and lets us really know how endangered our democracy is. Um, and it really calls for the re, re acknowledgement of integrity as being some, has having to have some place in the underpinnings of how we go as a society. We have to start there with some sense of integrity. And I think at least I saw their responses as really an acknowledgement and, and recognition that in, in spite of you know dark money, big money, who's got power, whatever, at some point, it's gotta come back to your personal integrity mm -hmm. and what you actually stand for. I'm, I'm, I try to be an optimistic person as well. These are some scary times, but I like to think, and I, I, I still hold that in the end, it's gonna have to come down to that. At some point, you, you, you know, you got to look at yourself in the mirror, you got to get to sleep at night. And it comes back to that sense of your personal integrity. And so we're seeing more of that take place. Um, even in the corporate sector, with the um, um, proclamation of doing away with uh, bias training within corporations and within government agencies, where that for many businesses has been a core piece mm -hmm. from not just a social standpoint, but from a business standpoint, you know, these big companies really need to have diverse management, diverse leadership, diverse directors, because this is how our world is operating. This is, you know, we're not just, you know, they're not just operating just in this country. These are global organizations in which you have to have and you have to be responsive to the countries and to the communities in which you're doing business. And you can't do that with just having, you know, just a, a bunch of old white men in charge. You've got to, you've got to address that. And so you're even seeing that pushback is coming from within, within corporate America. It's like, no, we're not, we're still going to do this. We're still going to look at how our practices and policies are preventing some of the most talented people in the world who happen to be black and female and of color from being a part of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really, really important point, Sandra, because the economy gets a lot of priority in people's minds without, I would dare to say, without 90% of them having any idea of what it really is and what really makes it work and grow. Hey, and diversity is critical. If you look at the leading companies, they are all going in that direction. And another friend who's really strong on the economy and financial stuff said, Chuck, look at it. Biden has had a commanding lead in the polls for weeks. Hey, and Wall Street is going crazy growing. Mm -hmm. If they were really worried about this economy tanking with a Democratic win, you would have seen it. Mm -hmm. In fact, if anything, it reflects greater optimism 
you're seeing mm -hmm. rising okay. areas that are long-term factors. Mm -hmm. So it, we're getting back to the point that Bill raised in the beginning, which is every single sector of society, when you really look at what makes it work, it's diversity and collaboration. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there's only one choice being offered that makes that even possible. Mm. So hopefully people will have a sense that hey, years ago, a psychiatrist friend, we're in our last couple of minutes. Years ago, our psychiatrist friend who worked with terminally ill cancer kids hey, gave me a piece of advice that I've, I've taken to heart ever since. And that is, Chucky said, when you have your hardest decisions to make, try to make the decisions that will bring the most true peace. I yeah. think if our people can do that, and that's in all sectors, mm -hmm. it goes, take it right down to the street, take it into the home, every single sector of life. And then at least for a lot of us, doubt disappears, right? Yeah. So last words in our last minute, Bill, Radine, Sandra, Party I, I, I would just add uh, another example to what uh, this panel was talking about is we're seeing a lot of heavy hitting Republican strategists um, form projects like the Lincoln Project. Yes. And, and that's yes. Really important. And, and I think, you know, more than seeing someone go against Trump or for Biden, for me, it gives me hope because it tells me that critical thinking is back. And that's really something that we really need. Uh, critical thinking that goes beyond partisan politics. Um, I've always worried, you know, that people will vote Democrat just because they're Democrat or Republican because they're Republican. I still think there needs to be some deep thought into who we choose. And it, it needs to be um, a holistic view and not just somebody votes this way, so I'm going to go with them. Um, right. I, li I like seeing uh, the fact that uh, people are really um, dissecting and analyzing this election uh, in ways that uh, uphold our values, just our basic values of being decent human beings. Yeah. And, and I would say that um, most importantly, go vote and following up what Radine just said, vote with your head, yes. but uh, use a pure heart. Yes. Nice. Yes, absolutely. it's a great way. It's a yes. great way to end our last pre-election yes. session. We'll be back in two weeks. We'll see you all in two weeks. Hopefully we'll get some of our <clears throat> returning panelists to rejoin us. Thank you all. Go vote. Pray Go for vote. peace. <laughs> Go vote. Exactly. Absolutely.